right, welcome back. Yes, as you've seen, the Larry Isalni who joins us next. He's a former deputy director of communication strategy for the APC, also former national publicity secretary of the same party. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today. It's my pleasure. Well, as you know, all eyes are on the ruling party. Uh, the economy is a big thing today. Several people just wondering when will those policies kick in and affect their lives positively. Yes, the president has issued several statements about what he plans to do, but to a lot of people, they're just plans. So tell us, uh, looking at how the whole situation is at the moment, what, what is going through your mind in terms of how and when can Nigerians just, as the president says, breathe and say, finally, this is going in the right direction? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, it, it, it's um, not going to serve anybody any good, denying the obvious. Um, things are not easy. And it, it didn't start um, on May 29. Uh, it's, it's been like that. But what has compounded it is the fact that there are certain steps that needed to be taken and that the previous government had shy away from. And without which we would continue to sink. And the president had demonstrated strong will by confronting those issues and by taking those steps. The aftermath is what we are facing. And the question you ask, if I'm going to reframe it, is to say, how quickly do we provide some kind of relief you know, that will cushion the effect of these necessary policies? That is where we need to um, you know, up our game. Uh, I must admit, um, the president has laid out a lot of things that are going to be short-term measures. The actual solutions to all of these issues cannot happen overnight. I wish, just as the president said, that he would find a switch, you know, um, in the villa and just press on it and then everything goes, you know, um, just the way we want. But that doesn't exist. Uh, we're going to have a building block progressively to get to where we should be mm -hmm. and come out of this um, Okay, so uh, challenges. at the moment, pardon me, Mark, why, what's going on with the cabinet? To who's going to help him lift this burden? Because he has to have people talking to people, moving around, doing things. No, I think what we should ask is why do we need to ensure we lay solid foundation, even for the cabinet to come in and take off? They don't have a solid foundation yet? Yeah, of, of course, this is a new government. And you know the way Aswaju is a technocrat. It needs to, if you bring in somebody to work with you, you must have job description for the person. But you must. They've since been declared by the Senate. Yeah, they declared just, just, just less than two weeks ago. Two and weeks. on Monday, they are going to be inaugurated. We have ministries. Um, you must be certain that the President may have his ideas on how the ministry should work. He may want to tinker with the existing structure. And he needs to prepare the bed before you ask somebody to come and lay on it. So that's the only way you can get things going. You don't want to bring a minister in and then you say, hold on, I need to restructure the base. So you need to get so all is those... Is that restructuring happening now? It's happening. Because we are going to hear ministries in terms of nomenclature that you are not familiar with. And those are deliberate to ensure that you provide the necessary wills to get things done uh, fast enough. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the, the, the bottom line is that by Monday, there will, there will be this exercise, you know. So, uh, and um, it's fair enough, I think. Well, one continues to wonder what the role of the transition committee is. You know, if it takes this long for a new government to settle down, especially given where we are. I mean, it was already clear from day one that, you know, things were not going to be easy. So we would have thought that there would have been a little more urgency uh, in terms of, you know, the, not just the constitution of the cabinet now, but some of the directions that we ought to be seeing. Uh, while you, you know, before you, just before you respond to that, you talked about how the president has demonstrated strong will. But some people said that his strong will was simply not enough, that what he also needed to have in addition to that strong will was a clear knowledge of where the country was at the moment before he took the decision 
remove subsidy removal. Uh, what we're feeling is not just the aftermath of a decision to remove it, but the aftermath of a decision to remove it in a way without considering a lot of other factors. It did consider those factors. Was he aware of them? He was. Was if he, he was aware, not aware of them, instance, he would not even contest the election. And all through his campaign, he spoke to these issues in all his appearances. He picked sectorially, he spoke to the issues. And everybody, you cannot deny the fact that he has a very sound understanding of what the issues are. And he knows exactly what to do. But many of these things require time in terms of policy design and implementation. So, and that's what you, you see playing out. It, it was not something he did knee jack when he announced right there, even though he was not on his, in his speech, mm -hmm. to say subsidies removed. It was, not, it was deliberate. He knew he had to do that. Yeah, that was yeah, deliberate. Yeah, yeah. It was deliberate. But he and he also knew mm -hmm. that, the, that there must be parity, you know, in the exchange rate. He knew that, and he did it. And he knew there would be aftermath. And now there are extraneous issues that could come that you need to confront that there's no way you could have known exactly how it would play out. Like the speculators you have who have moved in, the people who have been benefiting. Have always been there. Yes. But how they are going to react to that policy, you still have to continue to address it. It's not a one-off thing. When you take a decision, there will be, it's a cause and effect issue. When you take a decision, there will be reaction. And then you still need to address the reaction. Now, we have seen the game the speculators are playing, and he has just spoken to it. That's the reason why he summoned the CBN governor to say, I hope we are on the same page, and this is the direction we want to go. You know, so he, this is a man who has been working 17, 18 hours a day. Well, some of these things will begin to come when we get to mid and long term, you know, outcomes, you know, of all these actions that he's taking. Mm -hmm. so, but I, certainly, it's working, you know, um, um, on all of these issues. I, I, only recently, the central bank opened its books, published its books, and, and, you know, some of the revelations have been damning. And I'm wondering whether the president, when you say he was aware of some of the um, issues, uh, he was aware of almost all of the issues, was he aware of the magnitude, of the depth of the issues? Uh, well, well um, he wouldn't be aware of the magnitude because he was not working in CBN. But he knew enough to know there must be an action. And that's why the CBN governor that he met on that seat is no longer there. But now, we need to now see, it's like you have brought a wound to the hospital. They must open it up again before they can even dress it up. So we are in the process of opening up all whatever the maladies you know, that well, we have. When you say that he thought about this, it was deliberate and all of that, what is this talk we hear about the government thinking about temporary subsidy? No, we should always rely on official sources. No such information has come from any official source to say we are going to uh, bring back subsidy. Mm. I didn't say they are going to. Mm -hmm. I said, what was this thing we hear yeah, about that's them not thinking from about? Yeah, um, no, no, okay. no official spokesperson or anybody with the yeah, but we know authority that. to say that. But what uh, can you tell us about that? What I can tell you clearly is that if the, the, the government, which the media needs to do very well, government has no role to play in the prices of petroleum product. Just as it doesn't have a role to play in how much somebody sells his yam. That is the meaning of the regulation. That's the meaning of the fact that... Um, oh, yam and uh, subsidy let, are oil no, are two let, different let, things. Let, let, me, let, me, let me clear that. So that's what it means. So people import fuel and sell at the prices, but government cannot fold the terms and allow people to continue to suffer. So they have looked at the numbers and say, no, these prices cannot go up if we deal with the inefficiencies in the system. So what the government is focused on is to ensure that deal with the inefficiencies so that the prices will remain stable. But if you allow the inefficiencies to continue, then it will continue to go up. And what, that will be artificial. That will not... What inefficiencies be. are we talking about here? The inefficiency in the process of importation and delivery. You know, because that comes with costs. And so you need to address everything along the value chain to ensure that there's smooth operation and there are no, nothing compounding, you know, um, the, the transactions 
or making things difficult for the businessmen that are involved. Is this inefficiency not the same thing as corruption in the sector? No, no, no. The inefficiency doesn't necessarily mean corruption. It, it, it could mean that the operations are not done uh, the way it should be done. Maybe the structure is not there. Maybe the policy is not right, uh, even within the private yeah, sector. Isn't that part of what should have been done before that announcement and decisions to say, you, well, you, subsidy is gone? Like I said, that is a cause and effect issue. When you take an action, that will be reaction. That is what you address. You cannot predict, in most cases, reactions to your actions until you have taken the action. The only thing you need to do is to prepare for the reactions and to be able to address them promptly. Well, the government has consistently said that, um, even in the president's uh, the last speech on, on uh, the 7.30 p.m. July 31 speech, where he did say that um, there's this small, powerful, yet unelected group who hold enormous influence over our political economy and the institutions that govern it, talking about this subsidy cabal. And people keep asking. You keep saying people are stealing this money. There are people who are benefiting. Who are they? Can they be arrested and brought to book if they were doing this? Yeah, well, at, at, at some point, perhaps the government or the president will get to that. But you cannot have fire burning down your house and you're chasing the person who has set the house on fire instead of putting out the fire first. So what the president is focused on now is how to quickly alleviate you know, the situation to ensure that Nigerians have some form of relief you know, from the hardship that came as outcomes of these necessary policies. All right, let's go to our colleagues. Well, thank you, Chamberlain. Uh, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Onilu, you know, the president made some promises earlier. Uh, twice he has spoken to Nigerians about doing one thing or the other. First, he declared a state of emergency on food security and made some pronouncements. And a good number of people were expecting that, okay, within the next few days, weeks, or months, we're going to begin to, you know, feel some things. Um, and then he, there was that broadcast and a host of announcements were made. So one wonders if there is anything happening in those regard because if, for instance, those buses had been procured or some of those movements have been begun to happen across Nigeria in the various states, maybe there will be some hope in the horizon. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you um, that um, a lot of Statements have been made, a lot of promises have been made. But you see, it's like a man that is hungry. He cannot understand what is going on in the kitchen until he finds the food on his table. But a lot may be going on in the kitchen. And there is no shortcut to it. If you don't plan very well, you're going to fail. And the relief, the enjoyment will be short-lived. So you need to um, understand that there are a lot of things going on. And it's like, as I said, being in the kitchen. And eventually relief will come when the food is served. Um, we, we continue to hope that it will be done so soon. And I can assure you that um, the, the, the president, as I said, is working 18 hours a day to ensure that things are get done as fast as possible. And all these things would, would, would uh, begin to be felt you know, in, in, in the society. Well, Mr. Nilu, uh, Mr. Issa Nilu, you know, while, while the kitchen is, you know, seriously at work, one would wonder uh, whether or not the chef wasn't aware that the people are so hungry and consequently making that promise would most certainly get people highly expectant. So those announcements were made when the, the ministers hadn't already been sworn in. The Federal Executive Council isn't fully constituted. Now, those announcements were also made at about the same time that, of course, the fuel subsidy removal had kicked in, and a host of, uh, a whole lot of uh, resources are now being shared between the federal government and the state government. So one wonders, is there a role for state governments? What kind of communication is going on between the federal government and the states? Because even those pronouncements made by the federal government couldn't happen at all if there wasn't significant collaboration with the states. Have those collaborations started? Yeah, we, we must give credit to this president. He has worked very well with governors, irrespective of their political parties or whatever interests they, they serve. Um, whatever the that have been taken so far at the federal level, the states, the subnationals, are carried along. Continuously, they have been carried along. And that is why you have 
um, in the month of um, July, for instance, you have almost well, around 50 percent increase in the Federation um, account in terms of money to be shared. And they all agreed without any issue. First time you don't but have any Mr. conflict. Mr. Isolilu, when they say well, no, don't those, spend it's all one this thing money. To, to carry the people along, that the governors along. It's another thing for us to see the governors actually doing things for the people in their communities, in their environments. Just earlier this morning, my colleague was reminding me that a number of governors have already begun to push out one, you know, palliative or the other. But it is not going round. One out of um, one or two out of 36 states, it's definitely not collaboration. So one one is wondering, and a host of people are, are really wondering exactly what is going on. We want to make haste slowly, but at the same time, the lives of Nigerians aren't getting any better. When will the poor breathe? Okay, well, that, that sounds uh, good. Uh, but let me, let me say that, um, well, we must, we, must be, um, we must understand the fact that people are really not finding things easy. And the president is fully aware of that. But you see, it can just say to be popular, let's roll out things and then let's do things quickly and people say, oh, very good. And then six months later, we are even worse off. So there must be that, you know, just continue to talk to the people to say, let's be a little more patient. Not that government is completely, I'm happy that you have identified the fact that some states are already rolling out, already rolling out some of these palliatives and um, some of the interventions are ongoing. But even the state needs to plan. They need to work on this. Even if you're going to pro procure grains, for instance, to distribute, you must go through certain processes. And government resources is not there for anybody to just continue to spend anyhow. So there, there are procedures. Yes, somebody that is hungry doesn't want to hear all of that, but unfortunately, that is the truth. That is the reality of the situation. But the president is concerned. That's why he had to come up with a national um, 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 address, you know, which he did, to say, hey, I'm not sleeping, I'm working. But let's bear it a little more. I'm going to uh, ensure that we have a lasting solution, something that will last, you know, the, the, uh, survive the test of time, not something that we are going to rush and then rush out. Well, Mr. Nilu, at the risk of you know, um, belaboring the point about the delay in constituting the cabinet, um, you know, one of your party members who has resigned, by the way, and uh, his resignation, according to reports, hasn't been um, accepted, Mr. Lukman Saliu, has caused to also remind Mr. President in his open letter. And he says, um, Your Excellency, throughout the 2023 electoral campaigns, one of the strong campaign points was that you know how to find talent. When it took you more than eight weeks to nominate your ministers, the belief was that you're taking your time to identify indisputably proficient people. With due respect to all those you nominated, many party members, um, and by extension Nigerians, were disappointed. And just to add to that, um, you know, it's, it's been a while that the Senate has approved majority of the ministers and is still taking this long uh, to constitute the cabinet. Well, um, I'm aware of the open letter you're referring to, but as he also rightly said, it is his personal opinion. But what that speaks to is the kind of democracy that even exists within our party. That we are not all just slipping off. Certain people are talking, and this it has come to the public. But even within the system, we are all calling our attention to the fact that, hey, we need to do something quickly. And that's why the president and everybody is working tirelessly to ensure that we get results as quick as possible. But at the end of the day, like I said, there are steps that must be taken. Otherwise, we are going to have a short-term relief, and then we'll go back worse off. So we must avoid that. 
Well, the impact of uh, you know, the removal of fuel subsidy and the continued increase is certainly not waiting. It's continuing on Nigerians. Uh, but let's go back yet again to one of the many responses of the federal government to that, which is uh, the spokesman of the president yesterday telling reporters uh, that due to the inefficiencies in the upstream and downstream sector um, have to be resolved. Um, you know, just to also tie that to Mr. President's address, uh, one thing that is conspicuously absent is the, you know, um, explanation or clarification on the state of the refineries in every response that the federal government gives about what it's doing to resolve the situation. Why is the federal government under this administration avoiding that conversation? Avoiding? I'm not aware of anybody posing that question and uh, the government refused to answer. And some of the questions we ask at times, uh, we, we, we have um, other sources where we can get information. Um, the, this government has spoken to even the issue of refineries in terms of how far they have gone. We expect by December we begin to see outcomes, you know, positive outcomes, like the Paracourt refinery, like the Wari, the Kaduna refinery. Actions are ongoing. Journalists can visit, find out by themselves, and report to the public, you know, not necessarily what are your comment situation, you know, with, with the government? It's not all the questions that we ask of government. We can go also and do our job and get, you know, information across to the public. Because Polakot Refinery is there. Nobody has gone there and was prevented from uh, finding out um, the situation there. There are people that are involved. There are contractors. There are consultants. There are government officials that are responsible for that. And nobody has gone to them and they say, no, they are not willing to provide answers. So we should not narrow everything down to whatever the president says, whatever the spokesperson says, or whatever an APC chieftain says. No, we have a broad you know, uh, spectrum of you know, sources where we can um, always get information and then help the public to know. I want to ask this. Um, mm. The federal government says there is no going back or it, it has not gone back on its policy on the regulation. It's still Absolutely. very much on course. But mm. we do know, I mean, it has also admitted that there are inefficiencies in its midstream and downstream sector. Absolutely. Mm, which ordinarily should actually force the price up. There's a reason why we know that a number of filling stations in Lagos mm. have not been selling. Yeah, expecting, I, I don't know, um, I haven't driven around Abuja because I normally buy from NNPC, I'm not able to say categorically. But, um, you know, if other stations apart from the NNPC in, in Abuja here are selling, but we have reports, mm. confirmed reports, that a number of filling stations in Lagos are not selling at the moment because they think that there ought to be a price increase. So those who are watching the price and you're saying that already as we speak, there is somebody who is bearing the cost of that inefficiency, the inefficiencies which the federal government has spoken to. Is it being completely honest when he says, some, when he says that, you know, subsidy has not been reintroduced? It's not been reintroduced. When you talk of inefficiency, you know, we have competition now in even the marketing of petroleum products. What competition Competition is between NNPC and these other filling stations we have mentioned. NNPC has, see, at the retail end, NNPC has its filling stations selling at certain prices. Other corn oil and other, you know, oil companies have their prices. And there are multiple sources of these products now. You know, licenses have been given to multiple marketers. So if I have been able to do more in efficiency in my system, I can have a better price. I can have a lower price. And if you think, Mr. Olilu, I'm is, sorry, that is what that, competition is all about. Indeed, that's what competition is about. Mm -hmm. But we also know that most times people look to the NNPC. Uh, in our, yeah, it's in, because we still have our, the mentality that yeah, NNPC belongs to government. In a while, I mean, since the subsidy uh, was removed, we saw that the NNPC's prices have been the lowest. If this was our, that, is, that is the level of efficiency. Yes and the capacity NNPC can bring to bear on so its own if, business. So if indeed you know? the fear was that, oh, the price of NNPC or, uh, or the price of other markets was going to be lower than that of the NNPC, shouldn't that be a good thing? It would shouldn't be a good thing, but it is going to happen over time. Competition, that's we what We know that it's going to happen over time. Exactly. What, what I'm saying is that that is not the situation right now. It what people be. are saying is that government is currently bearing a cost 
that is, that, that is making the NNPC run at, at some loss. No, no, see, and that there, there are some amount of subsidies. If you have such information, I think you should provide it. But as far as I know, government is not subsidizing the foil prices. No. Absolutely capital. So no. who is currently paying for the inefficiencies in the midstream and downstream sector? Uh, well, it, it's now left for the media to investigate that. But certainly the government has come out to say, yes, we have inefficiency. Now, Mr. Alonso, hold on, hold on. Let, let me let me clear this. Let's, for the let's, media to investigate. No, no. Let me that. let me know, clear you this. You and I know that let somebody must be bearing the cost. It is either the NNPC is passing the cost of its inefficiencies on Nigerians, mm -hmm. or it is bearing the cost somewhere. So, if NNPC is bearing the cost, that may reflect in its bottom line, not necessarily that the government is paying for it. Oh. We must separate that. All right. We'll at the end of the year, NNPC may say our profit at the end of the year has gone down. That is the cost. All right. Uh, just not necessarily the government. Just so a quick we one. Must, we must separate those. Do you have any information if any state government has developed a proper database within with which they have to distribute the palliatives? See, let me let me say this clearly. There are we have a lot of data in this country, a lot of data. Um, we have what we call BVN. Banks can sit down today and give and pull out from their from their database who is within certain range in terms of deposit over a year. And that gives you a category. Uh -huh. You could go to find through NRN today, I mean data about Nigerians. You could do that through even the motor licensing. How many commercial vehicles do we have in this country? You can get that within one hour. Is that what government will use to distribute the palliatives? All this will come into play. All right. See, we have, really? we have about 12 million registered vehicles in this country, as we speak. Over 6 million are commercial vehicles. Okay. Okay. Well, vehicles. So all these are data that... We'll have to schedule another time where we can expansively look at all of these issues. I wish we can. We will, mm. uh, so that uh, lots of people could mm. drill down and understand what is playing, because we have the former Senate president, mm. several governors say, look, these things that you have mentioned, several people in the rural areas have no bank accounts, no BVN, no vehicles. Let me, let me, Those people let me, to... let me tell you that even under the past government, mm -hmm. in my state, in Kuala State, and it was in the news, and I'm sure even um, channels reported it, that a community, yeah. the women there, out of the money they were receiving from government intervention, uh -huh. built a school. Okay, we'll, we'll have time. We'll reschedule Rural another area. day so we can a look village. at some of these matters. Mm. But we need to go. We appreciate your coming on. Larry Isel Nidu, former mm. Deputy Director of Communication Strategy for the APC and former National Publicity Secretary of the party. Thank you for coming on. Yes, it's morning. my pleasure always. All right, well, back in just a moment, I will be talking about uh, politics, and out in which state. They are with us.